Let's get started and learn about ornamental grasses for rain gardens. And here to teach us is Dr. Esther McGinnis. Esther is an NDSU Extension Horticulturist. She's the director of the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Program, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Plant Sciences. Esther and her team of graduate students, they evaluate ornamental and native plants for pollinator attraction, rain garden environments, and for commercial flower production. Esther, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and it's, it's actually quite, um, quite relevant because here we've got, it's actually raining and we're going to talk about rain gardens tonight in our evaluation of ornamental grasses. And this very much is a team project. Um, I work with Aaron Day. Aaron Day is our uh, soil scientist in the soil science department. And we co-advise Randy Nelson. Tonight, I am going to be um, sharing with you Randy's research. So instead, I'm presenting for him tonight, and we're going to talk about rain gardens. And a rain garden is a bioretention basin, it's a basin in the landscape to collect storm water runoff. And the reason we do this is we want to keep the water on the property. We, want, we don't want to overload the stormwater system. And in addition, um, we want to keep the pollutants in place. Now, as you can imagine, when we have a rain event, um, you know, you have water falling on impervious surfaces, such as buildings, you have them falling on sidewalks, driveways, streets, and parking lots. And um, um, this all goes into the stormwater system instead of infiltrating into the ground. We want it to infiltrate and we want to keep the pollutants in place instead of sending them to our lakes and to our rivers. Um, so pollutants would include like de-icing salts that you would find on your driveway and sidewalk. Um, they would also include uh, petroleum products. You know, as you can imagine, your truck sitting on your driveway and you've got oil leaking. So we, we don't want that going into the stormwater system. If we can, we'd like that to go into a bioretention basin such as pictured here. Now, this is a, a residential rain garden, most likely in Maplewood, Minnesota. And as you can see, um, there is no curb anymore. Um, and, and this was specifically designed uh, to have the stormwater collect in these rain gardens. But there's all different kinds of rain gardens, including um, parking lots. And um, here we have the rainwater would flow from the parking lot into this, this area in between the rows and would collect right there and keep those de-icing salts and the petroleum products in place. We can even have downspout gardens. And with our downspout gardens, um, it's all about keeping you know, the water in place um, to allow it to stay there. Now, the problem is that um, we've got all these governmental entities recommending the building of rain gardens, and they're recommending all sorts of plants, but there's no scientific research on which to base those recommendations. The rec recommendations are based merely on um, you know, how well they do in a wetland status. But, but re we really don't have scientific studies on this, and there's also the fact that we have different climates. In Minnesota, it's quite a bit wetter than it normally is in North Dakota. In North Dakota, our rain gardens um, may have, have a, a really good thunderstorm, but then stay dry for weeks. So our plants would experience cyclical saturation, followed by maybe long periods of drought. We wanted to study um, plants to see how well they would take that double whammy of flooding and then alternating periods of drought. For Randy's project, we first um, worked, uh, worked on native sedges and if, ignore the scientific name. Um, so we worked on um, different sedges and we looked at their wetland status. Uh, so we worked with porcupine sedge and palm sedge, and these are obligate wetland plants. And these plants you would always find in a wetland situation. 
Um, and then we have uh, at the bottom of the table, we've got Pennsylvania sedge, which you would never find in a wetland. It would only occur in an upland situation. Um, and in between, um, you have plants that are in intermediate status, like facultative wetland, they're more likely to occur in a wetland, but you'll still find them in, in drier soils. And then facultative means you're equally likely to find a plant in a saturated wetland condition versus uh, a dry upland situation. Um, so we took these seven sedges and we looked at alternating periods of flooding and drought. And these, these were really punishing, punishing experiments. Um, plants were subjected to either two days flooding or seven day flooding. And then we had three different droughts that they drought set points. There was either mild drought at 15% volumetric water content. We had moderate drought at 10% and severe drought at 5%. And you know, going through several cycles, um, a minimum of four cycles for all of them. Um, so in, in some sense, we were trying to we were trying to take the plants to the limit. Now, if we had been doing animal studies, they would have called PETA on us. Um, but fortunately, we were just working with plants. And um, what we found is that the obligate wetland plants did not do as well. Instead, it was the intermediate plants. Um, the facultative wetland and the facultative plants that were in those intermediate categories that could take a more adaptable situation. Um, now here's palm sedge. Palm sedge, very much a wetland plant. And you can see on the left, we've got just a control plant, um, which did not go through flooding and drought. Um, and then we have the, the remaining three plants. They went through alternating periods of two day flood and um, mild drought is number two, moderate drought is number three, and severe drought is number four. And you look at number threes, number three and four, um, they are really, really stressed and they are showing a lot of dead tissue. So obligate wetland plants were not necessarily the key here. And, and compare that to a facultative wetland plant. This is Plains Oval Sedge, went through two days of flooding and then um, if we look at it, you can see that it went, um, the plants really, really did well under mild and moderate drought set points. Once we got to the 5% volumetric water content, the plant is definitely more stressed. You can see it's wilting, but it's not dying like palm sedge was in a similar treatment. All right, so we took that and um, instead, we, we wanted to look at ornamental grasses. So we're now going from Randy's master's project to the beginning of his PhD project. And we were looking at commonly found cultivars in the retail trade, um, including um, uh, Pixie Fountain tufted hair grass. We looked at North Wind switchgrass, Red October big blue stem, purpurescence, or some of you may know it as purple flame grass, uh, blue heaven, little blue stem, blonde ambition, blue grandma grass, and Carl Forrester, uh, feather reed grass. Um, you know, once again, we're using the wetland indicators. We did not look at obligate wetland plants because we couldn't find any ornamental grasses, which normally occur in wetlands. But we were thinking that based on our previous study, Pixie Fountain and North Wind would do best because they are, were in those intermediate categories of facultative wetland and facultative. The rest of the plants were more used to much drier well-drained soils. So let's see how well we did in our hypothesis. Um, now these are pictures of the grasses that we used in our study. Um, you can see they're all very, very attractive and would look very good in, in a residential rain garden setting. So the design for the ornamental grass project was very much very similar. You know, we had two flood durations, two day and seven day, um, but we did condense the drought set points into two. We had 14% and 7%. So mild drought and severe drought um, is what we used and then we compared that to a well-watered control. 
I'm going to show you a couple of, of figures here. You're going to see that in our big, um, in our um, dark blue columns, we have severe the severe drought setting. And then in the light blue was our mild drought setting. Um, once again, we've got all of our grasses listed as well as their wetland status. We had four that actually did better than the controls under mild drought setting. We had the tufted hair grass. We had Chinese silver grass, blue grama grass, and feather reed grass. But by the time we got to the severe drought setting, we saw that the plants suffered. They produced um, a lot less shoot biomass. So that's the above ground leaf growth. They produced a lot less because of drought, but that's to be you know, somewhat expected. We looked at root biomass. So you know, how much root tissue that was. And that was um, adversely affected by the 14% volumetric water content, but, and also um, um, adversely affected by the severe drought set point. So this wasn't necessarily telling us all that we wanted to see. What we found is that a picture can tell, um, is a picture is worth a thousand words. Here's Chinese silver grass or purple flame grass. And it's grown under the mild drought condition. And you can see the plants are doing splendidly, doing really well. Um, now let's contrast this with our, our severe drought regardless of whether it was exposed to a two day, um, two days of, of flooding or seven days of flooding, when it was followed by the 7% volumetric water content, we started seeing, um, started seeing uh, a little bit of dieback going on. There actually quite a bit of dieback going on. So this is where we really started finding our results, you know, by doing damage ratings. And when we looked at the visual damage ratings, we, um, well, first I should explain the visual damage rating. It's from one to 10, one is no damage and 10 is severe damage. Uh, actually, most of the grasses did quite well. Um, the exceptions being tufted hair grass. Tufted hair grass really did not take the drought well and blue grama grass. The rest of our grasses that have a C above them um, did quite well. Um, they did splendidly under the mild drought, but showed more damage under the severe drought. Um, now, some of you may be like, well, I'm not going to be um, doing a rain garden. I live in Western North Dakota, and it seems like it never rains here. Well, we can still take findings from our research and it will be useful for you because we did, um, we did this alternating flooding and drought. We were exposing them to a really, really rigid conditions and they really took a lot of drought, which can be applicable if you're looking to plant a xeriscape. Um, so we have purple flame grass here, and I'm going to talk about the ones that I'm going to recommend. We've got purple flame grass, which is a warm season grass. It has, you know, these wonderful seed heads, which are produced in late August and into September. Um, this, this is a zone three plant, and it's hardier than the other miscanthus species that we grow here in North Dakota. So of all the miscanthus species, this is the one that I recommend, and we've shown that that it will take mild drought quite well, um, but may need a little bit of irrigation when it comes to more severe drought. Um, but still a very reliable grass, reliable fall color, and it does have small rhizomes, but it's not invasive. Um, the small rhizomes will expand the width of the plant um, as it gets older, but it's really not going to take over your garden. Red October, our big blue stem, did very well. Uh, this is a, a zone four plant and it's beautiful in the landscape. Four to six feet tall, you know, beautiful, um, beautiful height on it, beautiful seed heads that look like a turkey foot. Very much a, a warm season grass that really looks its best in late summer going into fall. Um, 
and the grass at that time will turn red. It'll have that beautiful red coloration. You're getting that fall color in an ornamental grass. Um, it's a clump former. Um, the one downside to Red October is it will self-seed a bit. Another one to recommend that takes drought quite well is our Blue Heaven, which is little blue stem. Starts off the season, beautiful, beautiful blue-green uh, coloration, and then um, it, it starts to develop anthocyanin pigments, which is that red coloration in fall. Just gorgeous, gorgeous. It, it's not going to lodge much. Um, it's not going to lodge. It's going to stand straight up, and it's not going to be, um, it's less hardy in northern North Dakota, but it does quite well in the southern half of the state. Um, uh, so beautiful grass for whether it's, you're going to put it in your rain garden or whether you're going to put it in your environment um, that may be a little on the drier side. Northwind switchgrass um, also did very well in our studies. A zone three, a plant standing four to feet four to five feet tall. The seed heads aren't as, as attractive um, as some of the other grasses, but what's nice about this is that it stands straight up and down like an exclamation point, you know, nice columnar form, and you can kind of use this as a living fence, you can use this as a backdrop. Um, but, you know, just, just surprised that we can use switch, switch grass in different settings. We can use it in the rain garden switch, setting, we can use it in, uh, a xeric or drought setting, and it do, does quite well. And that brings us to Carl Forster. I have a love-hate relationship with Carl Forster. Um, for me, I feel like it's overused in the landscape, but it really showed its colors in our studies here. Um, did really well in the moderate drought situation, and I would, and it. it it seemed to do okay with flooding. I was not expecting it to take flooding the way that it did and to bounce back, but it did. So this is one of those bulletproof grasses. It looks great in the landscape, nice clump former, four to five feet tall and hardy to zone three. I'm gonna throw in a bonus plant. Um, Budalua gracilis, Blonde Ambition. This did not do as well in our rain gar garden studies. Um, it was less tolerant of the flooding aspect of it. However, um, Randy has gone on to do other studies beyond the rain garden saturation and drought study. We've, we're also looking at salt tolerance because as you can imagine, you know, salts accumulate in our rain gardens from all those de-icing salts. But Blonde Ambition um, did really well under fairly high salt concentration. And look, it's absolutely gorgeous. So for those of you that are living in Western North Dakota that may have saline soils and are struggling with your ornamental landscape, would really uh, recommend Budalua gracilis because it does well in those saline soils. Um, so here's another picture of Blonde Ambition, um, Blue Grandma Grass, just absolutely gorgeous, having those really unique horizontal seed heads that it holds up. Um, so in conclusion, um, these are highly adaptable grasses, adaptable to cyclical flooding and drought. You know, five of the seven I would recommend um, in a rain gardens setting. We did see that severe drought. I mean, we really took it, took these plants to the limit with severe drought, did reduce their growth and their ornamental value. Um, but, but that's that's to be expected. Most plants would then be able to take that mild to moderate drought. However, if we get into a really severe drought like we had last year in Western North Dakota, at that point, you may need to supplemental irrigate your rain gardens. Um, and if you have these plants in your ornamental landscape. Um, so you're gonna see more results to come. We do, you know, we've got a submersion study we just completed and the salt tolerance study. And right now we've got a study um, seeing how well these plants tolerate petroleum. Um, so I wanna acknowledge the North Dakota Specialty Crop Block Grant. And I'd like you to take our survey. So 
um, anytime um, we receive funding from a grant ag a granting agency like the specialty crop block grant, we have to show that we have um, shared what we've learned from our experiments with the general public. So please take the survey, um, which will show up in your chat box. Um, and um, I want to thank you for listening and thank you for tolerating my technical difficulties here. I have not worked in, in this on this computer this computer setting here in quite a while and uh, something was totally off. But thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you, Esther. And we do have time for some questions. Okay. Let's start with uh, there's a question about from Minot. Are any of the grasses tolerant of partial shade? Yes. Um, Remember that Deschampsia or that pixie, um, the pixie grass, that one um, will take moist shade and it does quite well. So I would say partial shade. I wouldn't say deep shade, but partial shade. The rest of them are going to be full sun uh, exposure. There's a question about what length of time is one full cycle and how long is the drought portion of that cycle? All right, so it, it was really... Um, very much individualized based on the plant. Um, so we allowed to dry, allowed the plant to naturally dry down to the drought set point, and that was measured, um, you know, using using one of the monitors that we had. Um, so some of the plants went through more cycles than others, but they all went through the same time period. So we ended the experiment. Um, for all the plants at the same time period, but some of the plants cycled through faster based on how fast they dried down and how fast they used the water. Um, so it, it really varied by plant. Esther, can these ornamental grasses be split and transplant? Yes, yes. These grasses can definitely be split and transplanted you can do that in early spring. Um, and that's a really nice time to do it, you know, before, before they really get going, you can, and then make sure that you get rid of the woody parts, you know, the parts that may be a little um, less vigorous than the newer growth, but yes, they can be split. How about, there's a question about, was a study conducted in a greenhouse or was it conducted outdoors? We conducted this in a greenhouse because we're going full blast year round with our research. Um, so, and we wanted to be able to control the amount of water and, um, and, and drought. And we could not do that outdoors. So very much a controlled environment. How about uh, is north wind switchgrass invasive? North wind is not invasive. Um, have not had have not had problems with that. I've not really seen them either. I've not seen them self seed. It's very, it's very well behaved, well mannered. It just stays put. Okay. There's a question. Are you doing any seed trials on these ornamental grasses, Esther, for the public? We're not doing any seed trials because these are all uh, cultivars and there's um, intellectual property there. So we're not um, and plus, there's also the fact that the, with them being cultivars, if we propagated them from seed, they would not come true to type. It would not be the same genotype as what you see here. Is prairie drop seed invasive? A prairie drop seed is a native. Um, and we did initially include that in our studies. For us, it was so so slow growing that we dropped it from our trial. So I would not consider it invasive, but it does take time to get established in the landscape. It is one of my favorites, but it, it's going to do better under really dry circumstances. There's a question. This person's looking for the purple flame grass that you talked about, but when she sees it in the catalogs, it says it's going to ship in autumn. Is that true? I don't think so. I mean, this is probably one of the most common grasses that we grow. Sometimes it's called red flame grass. Um, you may want to search by its name, it, it, by its Latin name, which is miscanthus, and um, use the cultivar name purpurescence. It's all over North Dakota. I mean, if you can't find it in the catalog, go to your garden center. I'm sure they would have it at your local garden center. How about with that blonde ambition? Um, we have one gardener who says she just can't get it to grow, so that she's frustrated by it. But another gardener says they're interested in collecting the seeds of it, but 
would that be a good idea or is that the problem that it won't it won't resemble its parent um, it won't necessarily resemble its parent. It may not have as good a characteristics as the cultivar. I mean, you, you're certainly welcome to, you know, experiment. We encourage people to experiment and, and to start seeds and such, but we, it's not necessarily going to be the exact same. Um, with the cultivar, we essentially select a certain genotype and it is then propagated by tissue culture or division to maintain the genetics of it. And what hardiness zone is that blonde ambition? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember here. Zone three or four, I believe. Okay. I, I, we haven't tested it for hardiness. How about do any of these ornamental grasses do well in planters? In planters, I like to see more of the annual grasses in planters because um, the problem is that a lot of individuals keep their planters outdoors as you can imagine, that freezes and then it, it doesn't, um, um, it's not going to be able to survive the winter. Now, at the same time, you're not going to big, big, bring a big planter into your house. So I, I would say stick with your annuals um, because it's just more problematic if you're growing them in containers. Okay. Here's some non-grass questions here. Okay. You had a beautiful Carl Forster slide. And next were, were some pom-pom looking flowers. Do you know what they oh. were? were? Are those ornamental alliums? Like, I, I can't remember. It was either alliums. Uh, I, I think they were probably ornamental alliums, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, I love alliums. <laughs> to look and to eat, huh? Yes, yes. Uh, how about, uh, Esther, what's some of your favorite um, non-grasses that, tolerate cycles of flooding and drought? Okay. Um, have not tested those. Well, what's but your I, favorite? Come on. You got to oh have some goodness. favorite. You, you're planting rain gardens all the time. You got to have some. Well, well if it was your I backyard, say, what would you plant? Oh, I'm trying to think here what I would plant. Um, I've seen Joe Pieweed actually do quite well in that type of setting. Ironweed does well, you know, and, and it all depends on, you know, the depth of your rain garden and such. You know, some of some of the um, herbaceous plants may do better more at, at a higher elevation as opposed to being down towards this, the, the bottom of your rain garden. But, you know, there are a lot of different rain garden plants that would do well. But I, I, Joe Pie Weed, I think, is one of one of my favorites. How about. Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's see here. Getting near the end here. You want to make sure I don't miss any. Um, so their question about uh, invasiveness, will the catwalk tell you about if, if it's invasive and does it invade both by seeds and by the underground rhizomes? There are two kinds of invasiveness when it comes to grasses. Yes, I mean, there's some that self seed really prolifically and then there's some that spread by rhizomes. There is that Miscanthus sacrifloris. That's one of, oh, I, I'm trying to remember the common name for that. That's one I would consider to be invasive and we did not include that in the study. That's the one that you see growing um, in old abandoned farmsteads and it's taking over the whole ditch. Now we, we don't work with those types of grasses. We only work with grasses that we would consider non-invasive because we don't want to contribute to the problem. So nothing that I'm recommending here is, is invasive. Just to talk to the people who are asking questions, it seems like that's the key word, invasive, that they would say uh, in a catalog or whatever as far as worry about spreading out of control. Uh, do you have any comments about swamp milkweed? Swamp milkweed. I love swamp milkweed because swamp milkweed um, does not spread out of control. Swamp milkweed will stay put. I'm less of a fan of the common milk, milkweed in an ornamental landscape situation because, or, because of the common milkweed spreads by rhizomes and will eventually take over a large area. Now, if that's what you want, that's you know totally fine with that because it certainly nourishes the, the monarchs. But in a small urban setting, a small garden, common milk, milkweed, in contrast, is very well behaved. Okay, how about when do you cut down ornamental grass at the ground level? Um, with ornamental grasses, 
you have a couple of options. I like to keep my ornamental grasses up over the winter because they provide winter interest. So I leave my Carl Forest or I leave my other grasses up. And you know, usually about end of March, beginning of April is when I cut them down uh, to facilitate new growth. And there's an easy way of doing it. I use a little rope, you know, tie off, you know, try and tie it off and tie off the grass so that I can just hack it off at the bottom. And then you know, I've just got that, that one big bunch of them. Okay, we just got a couple questions here. Where was that, that first garden you showed? That was, a, that was in Minnesota, you said, was that right? That beautiful one with the hosta? Um, yes, yes. Okay. And that's most likely Maplewood because they have a series of rain gardens in that community. And do you have a good source if you wanted to buy swamp milkweed? Uh, swamp milkweed, you know, really your local garden centers are really starting to carry these now. So I would try and see if your local garden center ha has it. If not, there are native plant nurseries and one of my favorites being Prairie Moon out of Winona, Minnesota. Okay, thank you. Esther, thank you for all that great information. And uh, let's just hope we get lots of rain so we can have our rain gardens. That would be wonderful. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.